Hey everyone, today we are meeting up with John Horgan, who is a journalist and professor at the Stevens Institute of Technology. We met up with him to discuss his book, The End of Science, which makes the pretty obvious thesis that science has reached its limitations. And so this is, of course, a very bombastic and controversial claim on its face. And so we wanted to unpack that idea because obviously our show wouldn't even be happening if we thought that science was nearing its end. And it turns out that he actually has a pretty comical approach to this. And in some sense, he sees his role as starting this discussion. And it's a discussion that we're very much interested in. So we unpack everything from the most accepted theories and perhaps what might change with regards to those, how his vision has changed since he wrote this book. Let's see, um, geez, 20, 25 years ago? More than that, he wrote it in like 1995. And what comes next? You know, what, what are the, uh, what does this say about institutions and the lifetime of institutions? It's a really funny and fun conversation. And I think we've made some interesting new ground in terms of understanding what the future of science might look like. As always, a huge, huge thank you to all of our patron supporters. We could not do this project without you. We don't want to have advertisements. We don't want to have sponsors. We want to be able to run this as an audience listener supported project. And so thank you to all of you who have joined. If you haven't joined yet, the link is right up here. And so consider coming by and joining us for a couple dollars a month. You can help us steer the ship, make sure that we have enough gas in the tank, both physically and metaphysically. Um, You can also join our weekly patron chat where we get together and we're trying to have these structured conversations on subjects that are brought up on the podcast, but people want to be able to have the opportunity to discuss their perspectives on it. And so it's really this community of science philosophy that we get together once a week and we talk about all of the ideas that are around the podcast. It's really fun and you should come join even if you just want to listen or hang out in the chat. We're going to have our first live event this year too. So if you happen to be in the Southwest of the United States, we are getting together to check out the eclipse together in Austin, Texas on April 7th and 8th. We have a number of speakers covering everything from the philosophy of science to solar physics. And it's going to be absolutely epic and a really cool chance to get together and ask questions of, you know, the guests that we would have on this show together as a group and discuss them. I think it's going to be really, really cool and fun. There's going to be some uh, really nice nightlife and evening activities and just a chance to unwind together and hang out with fellow nerds. So I hope to see you guys all there. And in the meantime, here's a conversation with John Horgan. I hope you enjoy it and we will see you next week. The scientific revolution starts now. Indeed, this is a silly podcast. Let us see in the dark. I think some a lot of people need convincing. I mean, so I talk to my students, and I'll be sort of enthusing about physics and Stephen. Talking, and then I'll look at them, and they're sort of looking at me blankly. And I say, "How many of you have ever spent a moment wondering where the universe comes from?" And they go, eh, "They're sort of trying to figure out what I, what answer I want." So some of them might tentatively raise their hand. It turns out some actually might have read Hawking or Michio Kaku or something like that, but very few of them care about that. They want they're in college to get jobs to make, to support themselves when they get out. I mean, yeah, oddballs, it's oddballs who obsess about these sorts of questions, especially from an early age, and then try to make a career out of it as you have. Uh, But I think some people, I mean, this is my challenge in my courses. I think if you bring your own passion to it, you can get people to go, wow, yeah, like, where did the universe come from? <laughs> and then, you know, they might carry that, that with them uh, and read books like yours. If they still know how to read. 
I mean, that's, I love teaching too, for the same reason. It's just this opportunity to really see how your ideas are connecting with people in real time. It's something you can't quite do. Like our audience right now, there might be thousands of people listening to this, but I don't know. I can't see them. I'm not feeling like who's connecting with what. It's very difficult to assess that. And I like that in a lecture, you can stop when you see those blank stares and be like, ask these kind of questions, you know? How many of you guys ever thought of this before? No? All right, why not? What's going on? You know, and it, it's really, yeah. it's mentally healthy, I think, as a as a as someone who's thinking and creating and writing and, and putting things out into the world to have that real-time feedback, especially with young minds, like you said, that don't really have, they haven't, I don't want to use the word polluted, but they haven't been completely contaminated by popular ways of approaching, you know, given problem sets and so forth. So yeah. No, as I said, it's the teaching is it it feeds into my writing and my writing feeds back into my teaching. And so that I'm grateful that I'm in academia, but I never sought tenure or did any of the I, I don't go after grants. I don't do those things that make some of my colleagues so unhappy. Can we talk about the end of science? Are you ready? Yeah, okay. I think that we should go into the end of sure. science. So basically what happened is uh, we're writing this book and I'm working on the introduction and I make the case that many people have argued that we are at the end of science. And then I started Googling around and I was like, my God, there's a guy who wrote an entire book about this <laughs> and has been you know, kicked around in various ways by the scientific community where like some people seem like they really agree with you. Some people seem like they really disagree with you. And I was like, we got, we got to talk to this guy. It's also, it also just seems like that's quite a assertion to make. Like you must've anticipated that uh, this would be a very polarizing topic. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's why, that, that's why I I wrote it because as soon as I came up with the idea, is could science be finite and bump into limits eventually, and could that be happening right now? Uh, as soon as I started talking to other people about it, they go, "What science ending? Are you nuts?" Uh, it it uh, provoked very very strong reactions, um, and some critics of my book uh, said, I just came up with the idea because I'm a contrarian and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to provoke controversy just to sell books, but, um, and suggested that I wasn't even sincere. How could I be, be sincere uh, when it came to such a ludicrous thesis? And uh, I've always said, I can't write a 300 page book that I don't really believe in. I absolutely believe in, uh, in the end of science, the limits of science. Um, I did when I was writing the book back in the uh, early nineties. And uh, I still do today with, you know, with some uh, qualifications and people are still arguing about it. It's almost 30 years later. And that thrills me because I, I, what's more important for me than being right, whatever that would mean um, is, Getting others, getting smart people to argue with me about this, because it's, I think it's a profound issue because the end of science is just a subset of this larger question. What are the limits of human knowledge? Here we are in this crazy reality. Can we really know it? Can we know ourselves? How far can we go? Um, is there some kind of ultimate answer waiting for us out there where we're suddenly going to go, oh my God, yeah, that's it. Or is it just going to be befuddlement forever? I'm leaning toward befuddlement forever. <laughs> I love the idea of the the writer as having the job of sort of stirring things up and getting the conversation going. It's in some sense, I, I like that because it's more optimistic than feeling. It, it takes some responsibility off feeling like you have to actually genuinely provide some new you know, inside, like you're moving the map forward. It's more just like, hey, this is a, an interesting question we should be talking about. Hey, let's have a conversation. And then kind of gauging your success by how much conversation results from that, I think is, that seems like a really healthy way to appraise your impact. That's very different from, well, I changed the discipline forever or something like that in this way that I intended to. Yeah, I, 
I think some of the, the biggest, most interesting questions can't be resolved. And uh, you can have these conversations that last forever. I mean, the limits of knowledge is something that goes back to Socrates and Plato and people like that. Um, I like teaching the parable of the cave uh, to my students because it brings up those questions about um, whether to what degree we're deluded right now in our belief systems and to what degree we can be enlightened by doing something, going somewhere else, seeing the world in a different way. And uh, the idea of a, a kind of final answer to those sorts of questions is ridiculous. And it's also terrible. I mean, how bad would it be if we did discover a true theory of everything that solved the riddle of existence once and for all? What the hell would we do with our time? I mean, searching for answers to the biggest mysteries to me is what makes life meaningful. I mean, you know, there's love and friendship and trying to reduce social injustice, and all those things. But, but to me, the most sublime goal is trying to figure out what the hell is going on, what existence is. And um, I believe that that is a never ending conversation. It might end only if we just, as you say, not very many people are interested in these social things. So maybe civilization will turn away from it. Um, and it'll just be this kind of fringe pursuit of cranks, which it already is to a certain extent, <laughs> but even more so. Well, you make this distinction that I think is really useful between the limits of science and the end of science. Because from what I gathered, the way that you were talking about it, it, where you were like, some of the biggest questions that we have are things that cannot be experimentally manipulated. And because they cannot be experimentally manipulated, like the origin of life or the origin of the universe or the origin of the solar system, that we can't really use science the way that we perceive it to be this laboratory discipline to answer those questions. And yeah. so that's different from the end of science because it's it's more of a limit of science. Yes. Um, I, I try to make a distinction in my book between... Uh, so I, I'm not a total postmodernist. I think that um, science does discover some things. Even to use that term discover is controversial postmodernists think that everything is invented, is, is uh, constructed, but our picture of the world today is based on some real discoveries. Uh, so the one that I like to cite is the discovery of galaxies, which only happened about a hundred years ago, which is amazingly recent. So, you know, there used to be these fuzzy patches in the sky and, um, and even Kant people, a long time ago, uh, speculated about what those were and thought that those might be island universes like the Milky Way, but nobody was really sure until the telescopes got big enough and then we could resolve individual stars in, in uh, those nebulae. And so, I mean, that was an absolute discovery that just exponentially expanded the size of the universe and gave us a much more detailed picture of the structure of the universe and that is um, irrevocable. It's just part of our foundation of knowledge and our picture of uh, reality. So my what some people didn't seem to grasp about my end of science argument was that I was saying that science is a victim of its own success. It, it discovers um, features of the universe, these profound features, you know, the, the basic uh, forces of nature, we have a timeline of uh, the history of the universe and history of, of life on Earth, and evolution helps us understand the history of life on Earth. Um, and I'm just saying that it's going to be what I said in the end of science is that it's going to be 
hard to top those insights that we've already had. You know, like uh, evolution and the Big Bang theory, quantum mechanics, relativity, uh, which have created this kind of map of reality that I think will endure because it's true. And so what can we come up with to top that? Well, if we discovered alien life, that would be pretty amazing. But we can't count on that. I'm losing hope. I mean, I still hope that I would like to see the discovery of an actual alien spaceship before I die, but I'm 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 not giving it much chance anymore. Um, discovery of the uh, of uh, the origin of the universe. I mean, there are all these theories out there, but they're just, as you know, they're hand wavy, they're pathetic. Uh, the mind body problem. Um, what's fascinating to me is that. Science seems to be going backwards. I was actually more hopeful for some kind of neural solution to consciousness when I wrote The End of Science than I am now. Integrated information theory is ridiculous. It's, it's such a, uh, it's just a, a wild stab in the dark. And there are more theories of consciousness now than ever. Um, hey, can you actually lay out uh, integrated information theory be or like sketch it out a little bit? Because sure. I, people keep kicking it. And there was that big <laughs> letter that, you know, a bunch of people signed where they were like, it's pseudoscience, which I thought was weird, even if it's a bad theory. And I just haven't had the time to actually go and figure out what the hubbub is about. Yeah. Um, so I took an interest in it because this guy, Christoph Koch. K O C H, um, this great neuroscientist sidekick of Francis Crick started yammering about it. Maybe I don't know, fifteen years ago. It wasn't invented by him. It was invented by Giulio Tononi, and it's uh, it's a general theory of consciousness. It's not just a theory of human consciousness. It's a mathematical model that says that consciousness emerges whenever you get. Whenever you have a system that has parts that are exchanging information in some way, and that can be a brain, obviously, but it can be lots of other things. It can be uh, a piece of circuitry. It can be uh, a CD player. <laughs> um, it can be a single proton because a single proton has three quarks that are, you can see them as exchanging information uh, between each other. Uh, because this is what this is what the mind body people have always really wanted not just a theory of human consciousness but a theory of consciousness in general that can apply to anything that you find anywhere in the universe the problem is the predictions of integrated information information theory are ridiculous i mean they just see information everywhere it's it it um, it assumes that panpsychism is correct, and uh, consciousness is is uh, pervading the the universe. I mean, if it's in protons, it's everywhere. And then you have all these questions about how a bunch of small parts create a unified consciousness in like us, and they have ideas about that, but it's just. Um, it's implausible on its face and it's, there's no way of verifying any of its uh, predictions, although the true believers will say that. So I've been kicking it around for quite a while now. That letter that you're alluding to um, has to do with some politics behind the scene that are kind of boring. And it just has to do with normal academic competition. There are some other people with theories of consciousness who are irritated that integrated information theory has gotten so much attention. So they decided to take it down by writing this group letter. Um, but if you look at the theories that they're pushing, like global workspace theory, or, you know, some of these other things, they're just as flimsy. All the theories are flimsy. And like, that's um, the thing about this entire slowdown of science, right? Like you mention 
that if uh, Newton was to be alive today and was to write the theory of gravity, to write the Principia, basically, and then send it to a journal, he would be laughed out of the room as a, as a lunatic crank that should be completely dismissed. And it seems like there's this shrill controller that has entered into the dialogue of science, which on one hand says that, you know, the end of science is nowhere near, but on the other hand says that, you know, this theory shouldn't be considered, that theory shouldn't be considered, this is crankdom, this is pseudoscience, this is bullshit. And I'm like, don't you think that those two things are related? Because we can't possibly <laughs> have a different Newton. We, like, we can't have a second Newton in this, in this current climate. So this, I try to, I mean, I'm, to the extent that I have a reputation, I guess it's being a, this kind of spoil sport and sort of mean-spirited cynic about science. And I see all these limits everywhere. If I, and, and so I try to be more upbeat and positive. Um, and one of the ways I like to look at what's going on in science right now, especially all this uh, theorizing about consciousness, the mind-body problem, which is pretty wild right now, is that, yes, the proliferation of theories of consciousness and their kind of uh, untethered quality, untethered from experiment, uh, suggests to me that science is hitting a wall, that consciousness might be a problem that is too hard to solve. Uh, which is what I said in the end of science. On the other hand, it's also so thrilling that you have all these ideas coming out on what consciousness is, all this attention being given to the mind-body problem, which is something that Socrates worried about. Um, it's been this theme going back through human intellectual life, uh, basically forever. And um, And if you just kind of love ideas for their own sake, as I do, uh, when I'm not being kind of mean and critical about it, then this period we're going through right now is fantastic. You've also got ideas from Buddhism influencing, I mean, you know, like tenured professors uh, in neuroscience citing ideas from Buddhism in favor of their, their theory. Uh, psychedelics are having a big impact um, on uh, on theorizing about the mind body problem. Uh, ideas from mysticism, and um, so yeah, that indicates to me that that the old fashioned science that actually gets somewhere, that discover discovers things that can be verified experimentally or through observations, that that is running into wall. But then there's all this creativity. Um, and uh, kind of wild speculation that for an old-time science observer like me is really cool. So at the, one, at, at the same time, I'm saying, oh, look, it's the end of science, just like I said. These guys don't know what they're talking about. But then there's another part of me that's like, this is so far out. Um, integrated information theory, what a trip, what a wild you know, consciousness pervades the universe. What a great idea. It's like ridiculous, <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> I mean, I to to go back to to the the thread that we were on earlier, I, I just get this feeling that you are right in some ways. And in other ways, I think that there is a way that you can look at you're being right and still see that there isn't an end to science. And the way that I see that is I'm like, okay, so your thing about we have models of nature that are based on observation and those observations have been done to great specificity. You're like, we don't have geographers anymore. Like we don't, we don't, we don't really need that so much because we've mapped the coastlines. And now you argue about, you know, the, what does it mean? What, how exactly do you map the coastline? And like, do you go around every single rock or do you like just, you know, make an approximation somewhere? Okay, fine. But it seems to me that most of our disciplines end up as 
really, really mathematical pursuits at some point because all scientists deeply aspire to be mathematicians. Like we were, uh, we were talking to Brian Keating the other day. Physics envy, we like to call it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, but and then the physicists envy the mathematicians. So there's basically this, if, if there was to be a pyramid of the sciences, like the great capstone would be mathematics. Below that is physics, and then everybody is just fighting for position underneath physics to be the one that's like closest to it. And you see this, like the field of quantum biology is emerging, and quantum biology is basically like, well, quantum is important in biology, and let's study that. And so I think that we've mathematized things pretty well. We've mapped things pretty well. And I think that where the really interesting things are going to happen is, okay, well, what's our interpretation of the mathematics? What is the math actually telling us about the underlying reality of nature? And so, you know, even with something like, with, uh, like, geology, like, it seems like it's more or less figured out. Like, we have all these rock types, we have this model of the way that the earth works and the history of it, and you can see there's this guy, uh, Chris Scotese, who makes these maps of how the continents move over time. And so he's got maps that go all the way back to the very, very water world birth of the earth and the continents appear and then they like slide around in this massive symphony. And I look at that and I'm like, well, that's one interpretation, but that's a story that's incomplete. That's a story that's not really taking into account all of the details. And so the real wonder is the fact that, okay, now that we have this baseline, our job now is to figure out what is a rational story to tell about the baseline information that we have gathered. And that by necessity changes as we find out more and more about nature, as we go to other planets and we're like, oh shit, it's not like it is on Earth elsewhere. Like it's not like this in other solar systems. It's not like this on other suns. And all of our all of our off-world data right now is so flimsy like we have these telescopes and every time we send up a new telescope we're like ah oh, shit <laughs> like yeah. that doesn't fit um yeah yeah these are really good issues you're raising uh i'll i'll start with the with the point you made about uh mathematics but i i don't let me forget about et because et is is huge uh but uh I was an English major, and then I went to uh, and I went to graduate school in journalism. I you know I liked math when I was a kid. I took uh, two semesters of calculus um, uh, as a, an English major, and and then that was it. Um, and so and then here I become this journalist who's like beating up on string theory and all these highly mathematical theories. What the hell do I know? Uh, And I always felt a little bad about that, even though I think I turned out to be right about string theory. Uh, But uh, I decided as a pandemic project back in 2020 to learn quantum mechanics with the math. So I suddenly, you know, I started, I got a textbook in, in calculus. I brushed up on, I, I mean, I, I had totally forgotten everything. I didn't know what a derivative was or an integral was anymore. So I had to remind myself of all that stuff. I had never learned linear algebra. I learned linear algebra for the first time. And, and uh, for the first time, I learned about complex numbers, imaginary numbers, all that stuff, and how those fit into uh, the equations used by, by uh, quantum theorists. And my goal was that well, everybody talks about how mysterious quantum mechanics is, but um, you can't really know the theory without knowing the math. And so, okay, I was going to learn enough math that I could get some kind of clue about what everybody was talking about when they talk about entanglement, superposition, and uncertainty, and all that. And um, and then I realized, I, I learned enough to realize that the math is kind of cobbled together. And so some of those people at the beginning of the 20th century, some of those brainiacs, they knew just enough math that they're sort of pulling things off the shelf. Math that went back well into the 19th century or even earlier, and it just turned out to work 
when it came to modeling the strange results coming from benchtop experiments in the beginning of the uh, of the 20th century and um and so the model works quantum mechanics works amazingly well but then you're left with the question of what it means what the math what's the relation between the mathematical model and between differential equations and matrices and complex numbers and you know this the reality that we're in or even just electrons passing through uh an electromagnetic magnetic field and you know the various experiments that are being done the math works nobody knows why it works and we've had a an argument for more than a century now about what it's going what's going on what the models mean what's the relation between these uh equations and uh the world can you say that the equations are true i wrote a column about this for scientific american the title was uh, is the schrodinger equation true and it's kind of a even the asking the question is kind of a category error um people I think even physicists, there are some physicists like Sean Carroll think the Schrodinger equation is completely true. It's this profound truth and everything must flow from that and be consistent with that. Bullshit. The Schrodinger equation is just this tool that happens to work well in, in some contexts. So quantum mechanics, my this quantum project of mine, I, I, one of my free online books is about it. It's called My Quantum Experiment. Um, it if anything has made me doubt the end of science, it was this project because I realized that this foundational piece of science, quantum theory, makes no sense. It can't be translated. The meaning is in the math, but that meaning is up for grabs. And you've got Bohmian theory, you've got super determinism, you've got many, you know, you've got all these cubism, which is, you should have this guy, Chris Fuchs, on your show. He's like, he's a trip, uh, this quantum theorist. Um, and I, I think that this applies across science. The, the, the weird thing about my quantum project was that I hoped I would come out of, come out of it with a little more understanding of quantum mechanics and um, the math and then the theory itself. What happened was, and that that would help me make more sense of the world. What happened was the opposite. I became profoundly mystified by quantum mechanics and by what it says. And I realized nobody really knows what they're talking about. And that affected all my other views of reality. I, 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 when I was working on this project, I was just walking around like mystified. I became acutely self-conscious of all the mathematical operations that are required for walk up and down stairs or let alone have a conversation like this one that we're having right now. Um, that's all based on what can be modeled mathematically, but um, nobody really understands the math works, but in terms of what it means and what it says about reality and whether it can be constructed into a coherent narrative about what this is, what we are. Um, I just don't think that will ever happen. I don't see any sign of convergence on a common metaphysics. And I'll be honest, I hope there isn't a convergence because then I think it's, it just means we've gotten tired and we don't want to worry about it anymore i think there are an infinite number of ways to understand the world and and to interpret the mathematics our mathematical models of the world and what a wonderful thing uh because it especially to the extent that these models include us we don't want a final theory of humanity i mean that's like a kind of closure that would be tragic uh that would be like deciding that scientology is the best way to see the world and to see ourselves that just means that 
we've been brainwashed. There is no final way to look at the world. So yeah, quantum mechanics, <laughs> uh, just to wrap this up, quantum mechanics really made me rethink the end of science because the end of science, my book was sort of about this closure we've, we've uh, achieved. And I cited quantum mechanics as part of that closure, but quantum mechanics is this giant, uh, this giant pit of unanswered questions um, that in my case have left me more confused than ever. Hey folks, Demystify Sci Podcast is entirely listener supported. So please come on over to patreon.com and consider giving just a couple dollars a month and you can participate in the actual production of this show. Streamline our conversations, figure out who we should talk to next and join that community. And we could really use your help. We don't want to plaster ads or have sponsors or anybody telling us what to do. And you guys are the only ones who can make that happen. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So it seems like... <laughs> You know, I, pr I really appreciate that you did that. I, I kind of had a similar experience too because I was in grad school studying these harmonic oscillators. Called, it, it's part of this system called an atomic force microscope. And simultaneously, I was teaching uh, this summer physics program and we were going into quantum mechanics and I realized a lot of the maths were very similar. And then I came to understand the atom in quantum mechanics is something of a harmonic oscillator. And I started thinking like, wow, what if it's not just analogously a harmonic oscillator, but it is truly like an undulating material body that's doing things. And I guess where I've ended up after all these years with that is like, I totally agree with you that it's unlikely there's going to be a final answer to that. But there could be a multiplicity of answers that at least have mechanistic integrity. In other words, that they don't posit supernatural occurrences at the heart of their explanations and so forth. And so I'm very motivated that science can, instead of dissolve into we know nothing about these topics, it can dissolve into, well, here are the possibilities that at least have mechanistic integrity. These, these, all of these ways of looking at this might be so, but we can rule out the ones that are, in some sense, been turned into these mystical, you know, nothing has to make sense because that's what the math says. And it's like, hey, I mean, anybody who's been through basic high school algebra realizes that when you do a quadratic equation, you're going to get sometimes unreal solutions to it. And that's not what you apply to solving your trajectory uh, issue in physics, right? And so, you know, for me, it's, it's really this project of reframing math as a map but then realizing that we need to study the territory not the map the, the map is is quite useful and we should try to refine it as much as possible but i feel like we've often in recent times been losing well for a hundred years maybe been losing sight of the territory with this like utter fixation on map making and and the map and how beautiful it could be and how intricate and colorful and wonderful and and mysterious and, and fabulous um yeah there, yes there's a lot i could say i i first of all i i have to point out that when it comes to so quantum mechanics you know we've been talking about uh what a strange theory it is and yet it works phenomenally well so from the beginning science has had these two goals of uh uh truth and understanding on one side and then power uh, science gives us power to manipulate the world and to do things and, and physics generally and quantum, uh, theory specifically have yielded enormous power, power. So, you know, the mechanistic aspects of it that you describe, uh, let us create new materials. Uh, they have been fundamental to the rise of digital, uh, technologies, uh, and um, I'm not sure, I still, have, I've talked to experts about this. I'm not sure how much quantum theory contributed to the, uh, uh, to advances in nuclear weapons, uh, but uh, certainly thermonuclear weapons, uh, based on our understanding of fusion processes, um, are 
um, are related to uh, to quantum theory. Uh, so, and power for a lot of people, I'd say for most physicists, is enough. That's what gets you grants and glory. If is if you you know that you've heard the phrase, uh, "Shut up and calculate." Um, shut up and calculate is uh, is basically the working ideology or uh, mindset of most professional physicists, especially in uh, academia. They're just trying to teach students these recipes for doing stuff, for the manipulation of matter. And that's what gets you career advancement, not coming up with a, a new variation of the many worlds theory or, or some uh, nonsense like that. Um, and what's happening right now, and I think this is related to the limits of science and the end of science and to the way you were just describing these models uh, that you've been uh, that you've been playing around with and teaching um, is quantum computation. So there's enormous hype about quantum computing and it might not live up to that hype. It probably won't. But uh, in the course of studying uh, quantum mechanics, a few years ago, I actually got an email from this guy, Terry Rudolph, who happens to be the grandson of Schrodinger, the Schrodinger. And Terry Rudolph uh, turned out to be a physicist in his own right, who had founded a quantum computing company. And I, we had this really great um, exchange on online just by email and then Zoom. And he convinced me that quantum computing is real and that his company might have a a working quantum computer that could actually do stuff uh, and fulfills the hype soon, like within a couple of years. And so that has got me thinking about, and that could produce new technologies and it could lead to advances in chemistry and material science, all these other things. You've heard all the, the hype, but quantum computing might also illuminate the structure of quantum theory in ways that possibly could resolve some of the paradoxes of quantum mechanics. And that would be, that was something that I didn't really anticipate when I was writing The End of Science. That would be an amazing thing. So quantum computing could have both practical applications and theoretical consequences that blow apart physics or not. That might not happen. But, but you are might. pointing to something. Does like you're pointing to something that's I think really key, which is that there the the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Right? If you can come up with a technology yeah. that applies the principles and through the application of the principles tests to see what solutions are functional and what solutions are the imaginary ones that you have to throw away, then you actually get some kind of clarity on the issue. Yeah. So the hype is a problem. So about a year ago, you guys might have noticed uh, there was this group of real hotshot physicists from Harvard and Caltech. Uh, there were some Google people um, and they got a paper published in Nature that basically said that uh, they claimed to have created a quantum computer that was doing calculations uh, that uh, somehow used wormholes. Transmission, uh, you had information being transmitted by wormholes that were in this quantum computation. So it was like, it was like, it almost was like give chat GPT the assignment of writing something that it has every single buzzword from modern physics in it. And it would come up with this paper that was published in nature by all these fancy people. And uh, I, you know, it was very abstract and technical, but I, I, it, I, there are some people I trust who said this is bullshit. And so I looked at it carefully and I, I concluded with my extremely limited physics brain that it actually was bullshit and, um, and that it was kind of a marketing vehicle for 
Google's uh, quantum computing ambitions. Um, and so there's that. This is a challenge for science journalists like me, but also people like you are just trying to keep track of what's interesting happening in science. Uh, when you've got people of this quality from the best schools spouting yeah, bullshit, um, then uh, it gets harder to determine whether genuine advances are being made. But just because this kind of thing happens doesn't mean that something legitimate won't happen in the future. Um, so I, th this is my challenge um, as a science writer and also as a human being. I'm, I'm like very kind of jaded. I've just, I, you know, been tracking science for 40 years now and just seen so much bogus stuff passing as science come and go. Um, but real things happen. Real breakthroughs happen. And I want to be open for that. And quantum computing might do something remarkable very soon. I'm hoping. I'm hoping it does. I, would, I always have said I would love to be proved wrong about the end of science. You know, our, our friend, we've had him on the podcast before. He's also a Columbia scholar, Adam Mastroianni. He wrote a really interesting blog about these two types of knowledge. Uh, one being established problems and making progress on established problems. And it, he makes the case that people who succeed in the academy are very good at this. They're very good at having a framework, say quantum mechanics, and crunching on it and understanding the whole body of knowledge and the way it articulates and putting it together and making you know, new connections within it. But there's this other type of intelligence almost, this other type of knowledge, which is more or let's say, uh, yeah, unestablished problems. So, you know, how do you make yourself happy? Or how do you have a good marriage? Or, you know, and there's some wisdom you might be able to glean from other people about these things, but at the end of the day, they're problems that nobody else has necessarily faced because nobody's lived your life before with your circumstances. And you might imagine that there could be progress, let's say, the unending of science, I don't know what the antithesis to your thesis would be called exactly, the, the continuation of science might come from a, a place that's not within that academic structure because people need to actually look at new problems that hadn't been imagined before. And it could come from the technological sector, like you mentioned, you know, maybe someone will get a new perspective who hasn't been working Maybe they're working literally in engineering those computers and they make some revelation about the subatomic landscape or whatever you want to call it, the electrodynamical landscape. And they, I don't know if they would have any success going to the quantum mechanicists and saying, hey, I figured this out. I don't know that that school of thought would be interested even in a conversation at that point until the chaos built up and built up and built up. But it seems to me that there is ample room to expand uh, the domain of understanding fundamental nature from outside of the traditional means of, ex uh, of going about that. Because you're right, in some sense, we have wrapped up a lot of these issues to the best of our extent with the epistemologies that are embraced by those fields. But if new problems become identified by people who aren't even thinking in those epistemological structures, then there might be whole new sciences that open up as a result of it. Yeah, I that that um, okay. Now you, you can see this. This is uh, something that frustrates some people I get in conversations with, and it even frustrates me about myself. Is that I take one side and then I immediately see things from the other side. So um, I like everything that you just said. Uh, but there are these, and I, you know, I've just been talking about, um, all these amazing things that could have happen as a result of, uh, quantum computing, but there's also this trend in science right now that really worries me, um, which is along the lines of, it's all about power and not understanding. Um, so you've got the rise of artificial intelligence now, um, which can do things for us and um, solve certain problems 
in ways that don't necessarily advance understanding. Um, so there are chat GPT type programs that are being used by mathematicians now. And actually this trend of using computers and math goes back decades. Uh, you had the first computer proofs advanced in I think um, the late 1970s, the four color theorem, and that's become uh, more and more common in mathematics. Uh, as the proofs have gotten more complicated, uh, mathematicians have relied more on computers to uh, to construct them. But this is happening across science now. So chat GPT, my understanding is that every field of science is, is uh, using these programs, not, and as well as uh, science journalists and, uh, and other writers. So there's this, there's a phrase that the philosopher Daniel Dennett used um, called competence without comprehension. Uh, that is related to Dennett's claim that consciousness, some people say Dennett is claiming that consciousness doesn't exist. I've been trying to understand old Dan Dennett for a long time now. He never really said consciousness doesn't exist. He said, he's basically just saying consciousness doesn't matter that much. And, um, and I think he's right that a lot of what we do in the course of an ordinary day uh, involves, we're just like automatons. We're um, engaged in these routines that are underpinned by these neural programs that are carried out without any conscious oversight on our part. And I think you can apply this to science more broadly. The, the philosophy um, of um, shut up and calculate that I just mentioned before that you hear a lot in uh, physics, especially in, in quantum physics classes, um, applies to a lot of realms of science where the goal is doing something that can do useful work rather than illuminating existence, providing insights into nature and insights into ourselves. Also science, when you get to the borders of science now, it's horribly complex and, um, and technical. And you've got people who are working at the, at, at these frontiers who can't even communicate with people right over here or right over here who are who are adjacent to their fields of study the 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 niches are getting smaller and smaller and more and more specialized they have their own jargon and so this goal of science coming up with a kind of an understanding of nature and of the world that is accessible to non-specialists is looking more and more remote. That's something that really worries me. And I see these latest products of artificial intelligence as, um, as contributing to that. So when I'm sort of depressed, um, that's what I think about. It's like we're in Plato's cave and we don't know what's going on, but meanwhile, the machines are making more gadgets uh, that we can play with in the cave and uh, more cool furniture um, to make ourselves comfortable, but, uh, but we're still in the cave. The, the idea of competence without comprehension, I think, is really, Im oops, is really important here. Hold on one second, I got a note. That was a weird artifact. Uh, like the idea of competence without comprehension, I think, is super. At play inside of these academic structures right now, because I remember when I was coming up and, you know, I took my first undergraduate lab course and you have to write a lab report. For the first time, which is some high level project that, you know, in high school, you never had to do. And as I was doing it, I realized that the way that everybody else was doing it was not by deriving for the very first time 
what it would look like to write a lab report that contained all of the information within it that was valuable and important, they were going and they were getting lab reports from their friends from the previous year and basically copying that format and putting whatever details they needed to put into it. And at the time, to me, it seemed absurd because I'm like, well, hold on a second. Should I not be deriving from first principles what a lab report is and then being iteratively taught as I hand them in, like, what pieces are important and what pieces are not? But that's not the system that science operates in us. And you see this when you get higher up in the system and you have to write a grant. What does a grant look like? It is not you sitting down and deriving from first principles what a grant should look like. You pull somebody else's grant that was successful and you hammer your ideas into it as tightly as you can so that the committee that's looking over it can spend the 30 seconds on the the first round and see if it's going to pass you to the next round. And I think that that process of institutionalization is what drives the competence without comprehension because this ties back into what Shiloh was saying, which is that the people that can solve a defined problem are different from the people who can come up with a new way to write a science paper. And so if you have a system that rewards exclusively those that can ape the prior expectation, then you create an edifice that can only reward that kind of thinking. And so you progressively get more and more competence. Like the people who are scientists are incredibly competent because you're right, these experiments are so difficult to perform and they're so esoteric. And it's no longer like, you know, I set out some bowls of sugar water with different colors and I watched what bees arrived. Like that's so last century. It just, it's it's incomprehensible for somebody to do that kind of research. And I think that this ties into a larger idea about the life cycle of institutions. Where uh, Shiloh and I have done a couple episodes on the origin of Christianity in, you know, the like pre-Roman times and the emergence out of the pantheism of the Greeks and this cult that becomes a thorn in the side of the Romans. And then somehow 300 years later, it's the state institution. And then a thousand years of darkness follows in Europe. And I'm like, hey, we're about 300 years into the institution of science. Is that, is that, is that like an incidental moment that we're sitting here and we're talking about the end of science? Or is it that there's about a 300-year period between the inception of a cultural innovation and its complete repossession by an institution that is like, I can do a lot with this. And then it just goes. And I'm like, are we, we might very well be sitting on the edge of the next thousand years of darkness because it's so bureaucratized and it's so locked down that what option do we have? Like we just have to, we have to, we have to fit into the institution and into the hierarchies and into the expectations. Yeah, um, that's pretty dark, and uh, <laughs> I, sh- I share, I share your sense of this being, in some sense, not only the end of science, but the end of a certain kind of culture or a certain kind of civilization. I wrote a piece a few years ago, inspired by the whole Jeffrey Epstein uh, episode about the decadence of science. Mm-hmm. Um, so I happened, I, I used to have this agent named John Brockman, in New York City. Uh, oh, he, he's a big a, Epstein buddy. Yeah, he was a big Epstein buddy, and and John Brockman also has a lot of the most famous science scientists and science popularizers in the world. People like Richard Dawkins and uh, and Steven Pinker, and you know, lots of major best selling authors. and And John Brockman um, introduced Jeffrey Epstein to uh, some of these big shot scientists, and then things would ensue. And some people I really respect and admire hung out with Jeffrey Epstein. And I was never on Brockman's A-list. I was I was not successful enough for that. And Brockman and I uh, split up about know, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, but before that, if he had invited me to one of these parties where Jeffrey Epstein was, I would have gone. 
if Epstein had invited me to one of his shindigs on his island, um, I definitely would have gone. I would have thought I, I would have been just uh, so curious about what it would be like, even though I might have heard the rumors about what was happening. That would be make me even more curious. Uh, you know, it'd be like something out of a, out of a movie. Um, but reflecting on it, I realized that it just showed that scientists are just like anybody else. They could be bought. This guy was just throwing his money around. And I, I'm not going to name names, but I know people who took hundreds of thousands of dollars from Epstein and, um, and then felt sort of obliged to say nice things about him when he got in trouble. And, uh, this is just a, a kind of particularly grotesque symptom of the careerism that we were talking about before. Also, uh, science is happening, at least in this country, in the context of capitalism. Um, and capitalism has a corrupting influence on science, much as we would hope it, uh, it doesn't. So I think there's always been this tension in science between sort of personal ambition and making money and accumulating power and the old fashioned ideal of science of understanding reality. Uh, and the balance has shifted toward the careerism and toward getting the fame and glory and get grants and tenure and all that kind of stuff that makes scientists um, not be their, their best selves. And, uh, you know, this piece I wrote for scientific American, it really irritated some people, as you might imagine, but, um, I, th I think it's, it's clear. It's, it's what you're just talking about that it feels as though this thing has kind of run its course. And also at the same time, I think it's not a coincidence that capitalism seems more out of control than ever. The whole billionaire tech bro phenomenon feels like a symptom of civilizational decay. <laughs> uh, but then there you are doing your thing. I, I, I know lots of people who sincerely are trying to understand the world and talk to other people about it. And there's still good ideas that I see popping up out there. Um, so uh, I try not to be too, um, too hopeless about where things are going. And then, you know, that's not to mention like threats to democracy and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff going on out there in the world, but there's still a lot of good things happening too. There are people... Well, you know, as I said, people like you uh, make me not that put too much pressure on you, but um, you know, there's there's still good people out there trying to figure stuff out in a in an honest way. I very much had this feeling when I was a kid. I read all of the pop sci books about physics and cosmology, and you know, I I actually had the sense that there was a lot of open questions. I read uh, Brian Greene and Michio Kaku and these people, and I didn't get the sense that they totally knew what they were talking about, actually. Uh, and so that was kind of interesting. And I, um, I found a book on, on the shelf at the library when I was a little kid called The Big Bang Never Happened, actually, by Eric Lerner. <laughs> And um, and I was like, oh, wow. holy crap, like, I didn't even know you were, I didn't even know it was possible to have an idea like that and to write a book about it, you know. Um, and actually, the regardless of what you think of the ideas contained therein, there was, there's a really interesting opening to that book, which talks about this pendulum swing between really, what would you say, certainty and, and doubt that happens across time in the history of science. And it really had an effect on me. And anyways, many years later, I actually had the chance to, to meet Eric. And, you know, uh, the, the alternative that he was offering, like you said, some of these alternatives to standard cosmology, they, they have their problem sets as well that make them in some sense not, to me, necessarily more attractive. Uh, and so many, many years later, I, I found myself really trying to get to the bottom of these things and trying to understand the, the real primary data, the astrophysical data. 
And I, I en ended up uh, finding my place now where I'm actually teaching these subjects. And you know what they say about teaching, right? It's like, you don't really understand anything until you try to teach it to people. And then you realize how little you actually understand. But it's been cool because I had the chance to actually go back and look at the history of the development of the ideas that are foundational, like before the Big Bang, uh, really all the way back to what the heck a star is. And there's a rich, rich history in the 1800s about this debate. And, and it's before this careerism had entered into science. So people, these guys who are doing this astronomy, you know, they're doctors, they're lawyers, like they have jobs, they're even some of them are like mayors and right. They just, they think it's cool to try to understand nature and there's none of this careerism. And so there's this very open letter writing atmosphere, this culture of, you know, one of the, this guy, Herschel, he's, he's talking about people living on the sun, like along with having really brilliant ideas about the composition of the stellar atmosphere. Like these are equally, you know, no one's just like canceling this guy for this ridiculous idea. Although most people are probably are kind of like, wait, that's not a good idea, you know? So there's a real climate of openness. And um, I, I, in addition to like seeing that collapse over the 20th century, um, I realized that there is this tendency to treat the decisions that were made in the early 20th century as sacrosanct and having built upon them on and on and on. And, you know, in your book, you talked about uh, one of the biggest opponents of the Big Bang Theory, maybe the most famous uh, opponent, which is Fred Hoyle, and how Fred kind of surrendered because of this uh, discovery of the CMB, which I would say is probably the first time that cosmology became a real hard science as well, it was in the 60s. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of thinking about the CMB, and, and I discovered something that was really alarming about the CMB. Um, and I'll tell you about that in one second. But you may have noticed that with the new James Webb telescope data, there's, there's a renewed debate about the, the, the Big Bang Theory. And we've had a gentleman on the show from the University of Ottawa who had proposed this alternative explanation for the data, which he moves the date of the universe back maybe twice as far as it is right now. And all of that's very interesting. But uh, so I, I was thinking about this CMB thing some more. And it's interesting how the CMB uh, really comes down to this beautiful black body spectrum. And so a black body uh, is traditionally this experiment where you have a, a very particular kind of material that essentially is heated from within and gives off a light that's commensurate with its temperature. And it turns out to be the backbone, the backbone of almost all of astrophysics and cosmology is this basic black body research that's, that was done on a laboratory by essentially this, almost all of it was championed by this one dude named Kirchhoff um, back in the 1800s, uh, along with Bunsen from Bunsen burner fame. They essentially set up the field of spectroscopy and black body science as we know it. And one thing that's very uh, troubling about this entire enterprise is that when people were studying black bodies, they very quickly realized that you, when you heat up a solid or a liquid, you get this beautiful spectrum that has, it's almost like a perfect fingerprint. You, you just don't see it in nature anywhere else. But when you heat up a gas, you get a very different kind of spectrum. You get these individual lines. And, and I, the way I think about that is that when a, a gas is this kind of uh, individualized atoms, and they can only vibrate in a few different ways. And so the light that, that results uh, from their electron vibration is also limited in that sense. But when you have a lattice of material, as you might in a solid, or, and you have transient lattices in liquids, and, and you have all these new articulation nodes that you can get mo like almost an infinite series of vibrations out of it. So this makes a lot of sense. The, the problem comes, and there was a huge s debate about this in the 1800s and leading right up into the 1900s with uh, Eddington and his, his brilliant ideas about fusion, was that how in the world could the sun possibly be a ball of gas if it gave us this beautiful black body spectrum? And, you know, to make this relevant to cosmology, the 
cosmic microwave background radiation is also this beautiful black body spectrum. And the interpretation is that it is left over from these, this ionization event, this recombination, where atoms first appear in this gaseous form. And that they're, of course, bounced around for, for millions and billions of years until we get, again, this perfect black body spectrum. But it's, it, it, it's very disturbing to me because, in some sense, we've never seen anything like this. This isn't really a scientific finding. You cannot make a black body spectrum using gases or gaseous plasmas in a laboratory on Earth. No one's ever done it. No one's ever done anything even close to a black body spectrum with these. And yet, it forms the basis for all of our relationships to the stars and how we interpret their lights from everything from the mass luminosity relationship to the cosmic microwave background radiation. And, and the deeper that I dug into this, the more nervous I got about all of it because everything was built on the back of this assumption, which didn't seem like a real scientific assumption. It wasn't a laboratory-based empirical assumption. It wasn't founded in anything other than the hope, the hope that if, you had enough gas in one place, it would behave differently. And so I'm looking at this, uh, this whole cosmological science, which is such a new science. I would say it's probably the newest science that we have. I mean, I guess AI and so forth might be considered newer. But it's really, it's been around since the 60s, basically. And it is in some sense, the, the initial theory of cosmology very much reflected this, this creation myth that had been around for perhaps since the dawn of humanity, this birth of existence uh, from this egg almost. You know, you see it in cultures all across the world. And so, yeah, I guess in some sense, I, I just want to say that the more I studied this, the, the more shaky I, I felt that the conclusions were. And I, I wanted to sort of pipe up for, for Hoyle when I was reading your book and be <laughs> like, oh, if only Fred was around today, I would love to have this conversation with him. Because I do think that that's what actually ended up getting him to abandon his, his alternatives. And uh, yeah, so that was just a, a really profound experience I had that I think is in some ways similar to you trying to get to the bottom of quantum mechanics, where you you kind of realize that, oh my God, I don't think that anyone has the answer to this this very these very important questions and maybe that's okay because maybe it will lead to a proliferation of theories and we can select among them at some point but i do think that it's much more on the ropes uh, as a science than it was perhaps when you wrote this book uh uh, yes and no by the way I, i just everything you said is just so interesting to me i didn't realize that the backstory of um, the cosmic microwave background was that uh, goes that far back and is that kind of insubstantial when you get to the core uh, assumptions. That's really interesting. I just have to mention Eric Lerner. Uh, my first job, I worked for an engineering magazine in the early 80s, and there was this uh, wacky freelance writer who was always hanging around who wrote articles for us named Eric Lerner. And um, I don't think he'd published his book, The Big Bang Never Happened, but he was constantly haranguing me about it until I was like, just like, give me a break, Eric. I'm trying to finish this article here. <laughs> and, you know, he was the, he was the kind of guy like kind of spit flying out of his mouth, a true sort of obsessive. This is ad hominem and it's unfair. But anyway, I, I when his book came out, I read it. And then I, I wrote a rebuttal of it for Scientific American in the in the late or uh, around 1990, I think, um, called Big Bang Bashers, because there are a bunch of them. There's uh, Fred Hoyle, there is Jeffrey Burbage. Uh, you know, there are people who said that the um, the Doppler shift of galaxies was because of tired light. It wasn't really a Doppler shift. And so, you know, there were explanations for all the major pieces of evidence for the Big Bang. And I went through them one by one and said why I didn't really take them seriously. And I, you know, I think of myself as anti-authoritarian, but when it comes to the Big Bang, I, you know, I go with what the status quo is. But um, who the hell knows? I, I, I met this guy some years back called Bjorn Ekborg, who um, got a PhD in philosophy, and his thesis was on how the Big Bang is bullshit, and uh, really smart guy. And he brought up issues that I think are similar to the ones that, that you brought up. I just still go with, um, you know, the microwave background, in spite of what you just said, 
there are all these smart people who still take it seriously as the afterglow of the Big Bang. The redshift of galaxies is another very robust piece of uh, evidence. And then the, you know, the relative abundance of light, light element, you know, so those are the major pieces of evidence. Um, there is a really interesting, the- like regarding those two, that's another thing that's just got me a little bit like, uh, what's the word? Uh, sort Squir- of squirming, squirming over the event is that the the <laughs> projections of the date of this event from both of those two pieces of data are are very tight projections. They're modeled with the evidence. They fit very tightly, but there there's several sigma of standard deviation away from one another. The answers that you get from them, and that that's, that's a that's an interesting issue that's become more and more of a concern. So I I don't know if you you bring this up. I, I just wrote a piece because uh, there were a couple of uh, astrophysicists, uh, Marcello Gleiser and some other guy, uh, these big big shot astrophysicists who were saying that the Webb telescope is drawing attention to these problems with our the standard model of uh, cosmology. And so maybe it's all wrong and we're going to be in this revolutionary new period. And then I, I wrote this piece saying, no, don't worry about it. Big Bang is fine. That some of the um, implications of very detailed versions of the Big Bang are in trouble and they bring up dark matter and dark energy and things like that. So I wrote this kind of stuffy defense of, uh, of the old Big Bang theory. Um, it would be far out if it turned out to be wrong. That would definitely be something that would overturn one of my assumptions in, uh, in the end of science that the big bang theory is basically uh, correct. What's interesting about the history of the big bang to me, and part of this comes from uh, talking to Fred Hoyle about it is that a lot of the resistance to the theory came from people thinking it's too religious. What are you kidding me? This just sounds like, uh, you know, Christianity with equations uh, or Genesis with equations. And uh, so it can't possibly be right. It's wishful thinking. And then, as you say, the cosmic microwave background um, convinced most people that that it was correct. Um, Science is, if, if I could just sort of go to a larger issue, science is very conservative. And uh, once the status quo gets baked in, when it comes to a theory like the Big Bang, it's really hard to overturn it. There's a lot of inertia in the system. In the system, at the same time, as you know, they're always. I mean, ambitious scientists want to be the, the revolutionaries. They want to be the next uh, uh, Schrodinger or um, or Einstein, uh, overturning everything and showing that the, you know the big shots of the past were were really misguided in some way. And so there are a lot of people who would could make their careers by demolishing, I don't know, one of the pillars of the Big Bang. And I just haven't, I the fact that it hasn't happened is also um, evidence to me that the the fundamental theory is sound. The analogy that I like to make is to the theory of evolution by natural selection. So when it comes to the the evolution of life, there are lots of puzzles about exactly how speciation occurred and, um, you know, horizontal gene transfer through uh, viruses and bacteria and things like that. There are all these things that Darwin couldn't possibly have uh, anticipated and lots of outstanding question questions, but the fundamental, the core of evolution by natural selection has been confirmed over and over again, and it's robust and sound. And that's still how I see the Big Bang Theory, but I'm hoping I'm wrong. I I hope, I think you should, if you haven't already, you should write an article about what you just said. That was a great riff you had going back to the origins of black body radiation saying that, you know, the science is actually not that. Uh, firmly established and how it leads to some of these uh, problems um, when you get to uh, the sun even and uh, let alone the cosmic microwave background that would 
that would really be cool. I'd like to see what the reaction it's, would be to that. Just, I, I mean, I've I've had this conversation with many, many astrof. I have a number of friends who are, who are in a better position than me to to write that kind of an article, and it's such a touchy issue, right? It, it, <laughs> it's it really it really emotionally sets people off that something that foundational could have been. I don't even think it was overlooked. I think there's a rich history of debating this. I just think that Eddington had such a brilliant idea about fusion that people just, you know, the other the other champion, the guy who was actually championing a, a very different model for the sun, which was um, something more liquid-like. A li- uh, um, well, first of all, they hadn't discovered liquid metals at the time, especially they had, didn't weren't capable of doing the laboratory pressure temperatures necessary to do that but his model for powering the sun was was objectively wrong like he thought that the sun was powered by radioactive decay and they didn't know the sun was made out of almost entirely hydrogen and helium at the time and as soon as they discovered that this other guy his name's james jeans just completely out of the picture everything he ever thought his whole material model for the sun completely gone eddington uses this gaseous model to do this fusion reaction at the heart and that's it and there's also like a statistical mechanics explanation for how the photons on the inside of the sun basically bounce around for millions of years before they escape and as they bounce around their wavelengths are smeared and so that's what produces the perfect shape of the black body that was all much later but yeah like but that's what i'm saying is that like eddington comes up with the model by subsequent generations exactly Exactly. and so when you talk to people about it and you're like hey isn't it weird that you can't do this in a laboratory they're like well you don't know anything about radiative transfer models and i'm like no no no. like i get it like i've seen the equations like it's not illogical and you've done a good job of being able to produce that but it's just it's a really hard conversation to have especially if people aren't aware of the the foundational science like why why do we what the, why do we even talk about black bodies like what was the experiments that led us to believe in the concept of a black body and nobody has time for that right you're in grad school you're like just <laughs> you're in you got your head down you're cranking on some problem trying to not get kicked out of school or whatever uh trying to compete trying to get those grants trying to get that postdoc lined up like it's just not nobody's going back and really thinking about these these underlying issues. We've tried to, we've actually pitched this story to like Scientific American and Discover. And at the end of the day, they're like, okay, do you have peer reviewed papers yes. about this theory? And we're like, well, n- no. And they're like, pass. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I get that. Um, by the way, I, I just want to, it, it just occurred to me. I had a section in um, the end of science. I think it had a sub, headline called something like the sun problem and this is this is related to something anastasia said earlier that uh once if we do somehow go out into the universe especially if we can somehow leave our solar system i don't know if that's ever going to happen i don't know if we're going to live long enough for these sci-fi scenarios to come to pass but if we do or even with some of these amazing telescopes like the web Uh, that we have now, as we learn more about the universe, some of our assumptions might be, might be toppled. Um, I have a little essay in the end of science, uh, just focusing on the sun and talking about how of all the stars in the universe, the sun is the most puzzling. And it's obviously because we can just see it in so much detail. And I mean, last time I checked, we we still don't know what sunspots are. We don't know what explains their cyclic uh, uh, properties. Um, I don't know if solar neutrinos has been figured out yet, but that was a puzzle uh, last time I checked. Um, you're, you brought up something that I, I wasn't even aware of, uh, these other issues about uh, um, about the structure of the sun, its overall um, properties. And so whenever we learn about something in detail, this applies to animal biology. We're, we're, now there's all this talk about um, jellyfish being conscious, insects being conscious. I, I went to a conference at NYU uh, on the topic of animal consciousness. Some of the, the talks were mind blowing. And it's because people are just looking at individual organisms in such detail that they're learning all this stuff they couldn't have been anticipated and it's making them question basic assumptions in the same way with uh, the sun. So I guess this is, 
you know, I'm, I'm bringing up another uh, reason why the end of science might be um, rendered obsolete, that some of these little detailed observations might lead to overturning of these big structural elements of our scientific worldview far out if that happens. I hope it does. I don't see anything that makes me change my mind about the big bang yet, but definitely could happen. Demystify Sci's very first live event is being held this April 7th and 8th in Austin, Texas. We are gathering to watch the solar eclipse and we are going to have talks from several of our favorite scientists. We have Alberto Martinez on the history of physics. We have Thad Roberts on his search for theory of everything. We have Pierre-Marie Robitaille as our guide to the history of solar physics and to the eclipse and to his model of the liquid sun. We have a special guest appearance by Michael Levin, who will come remotely just for an hour for a Q&A session with attendees. And we're going to hold a workshop on material atomics. And it's going to be a really, really good time. It's pretty intimate. Probably like 30 or 40 people are going to be there. And we're going to spend two days just nerding out about all of our favorite subjects. So come over here and check out tickets. We hope to see you there. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to persuade you of anything uh, with regard to that. I just wanted to share like my own shock and and awe at the at the whole experience of trying to understand those things but it does seem like that is kind of the only reasonable antithesis to your book is just that you, you might you, you seem to make a really good case that these structures have reached kind of in some sense limitations on what they can say and so if progress is to happen and let's say there isn't an end of science it might involve going back to the foundations of some of those structures and you know, kind of pulling the Jenga blocks out of those and being like, wait a second, now we have a, if we really do decide that some of these foundational assumptions are misled, now we have a whole, we could basically do the whole project all over again. And it's so, an, another 300 years of work. Well, so here's, here's the overarching question for me. So, you know, when I was giving talks on the end of science after my book came out and, and I, I'd be facing these crowds of generally hostile scientists and they they, they would say uh, you know what would convince you that you're wrong how about this and this and and some of them would bring up the big bang and um or you know overturning in relativity or or whatever and i'd say my my meta claim is that science converges on a a consensus picture of reality eventually and um to the extent that it can science is always limited by uh by what's physically possible with experiments and observations by what's politically and economically possible by what our brains can process and all these sorts of things um but my basic argument is that science gets some things right and uh and this is analogous even though a lot of philosophers hate this uh, this metaphor. It's analogous to um, what Anastasia was saying before about the discovery of the planet. You know, you, you sort of map out the basic structure of the earth, which we've done by now, and you reach a period of diminishing returns. Um, you're not going to discover a new continent. You're not going to discover Atlantis, you know, deep under the ocean or or uh, something like that. And then you have to go on to uh, to the next thing. So my question would, for you would be, let's say the cosmic microwave background, there is an alternative explanation for it. And redshift of galaxies, same thing. And the Big Bang is replaced by a different model proposed by Eric Werner or somebody else. Is that the final theory? In other words, so there, there are some philosophers who, who say scientific revolutions forever. There's no possibility of closure. Every time you have a paradigm, this is what Thomas Kuhn would say, um, every time you have a, a paradigm, um, it's always tentative and subject to change. I don't believe that. And that's why I cited the discovery of galaxies before. That to me is a clear-cut scientific advancement. We're discovering a feature of nature. And um, I think that's true of a lot of, you know, like the periodic table of 
elements and the basic structure of atoms and things like that, I see as permanent parts of our foundation of knowledge that won't be overturned. Some of those things might be overturned, individual parts, but then they'll be replaced by something else that's permanent. That's my thesis. Now, that could be wrong. The postmodernist and Thomas Kuhn could be right, and it will be scientific revolutions forever. I think it's I both. Would be- I think it's both. Like, I think there are definitely things that we're not going to change our mind probably about the Earth being the way that, you know, having the map that we have. Of or the just being round. Like, let's just being say round. That. Okay, let's just keep it, let's keep <laughs> let's it simple. Keep it simple. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's things like that with, like, the, the Big Bang. It's like, okay, I don't think that it's obvious to most people how much that affects the rest of science, actually. You know, the Big Bang puts a limit on the construction of all of these bodies on the time necessary to even make a star like our sun. Probabilistically also. Yeah, prob- the po- probabilisticness of it, of even having other life forms present. Uh, it really does change things in this way that has ripples throughout. And so yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not sure, uh, I don't have an alternative proposal f- for the Big Bang. Um, I just am intrigued by how much it is taken for granted. And the deeper that I look into it, the less convinced I am of of the arguments for the interpretation of the data as the only possible interpretation of the data. And so I think it could be both. I, I think there's definitely, uh, I think there's there's room for us to be completely shocked by things that have been sitting in front of our eyes the whole time. And yeah, there's things that are just absolutely not going to change too. I yeah. actually... How did... Yeah, so go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to just bring up, since you guys both came from a biology background, um, how you feel about the the theory of evolution. So if you're an old science journalist like me, you say some of these things, it's it's like they're on a Google calendar and you got a reminder every couple of years, write an article questioning whether the theory of evolution by natural selection is true, because that's great clickbait. And there have been some... uh, books written, very good books. There's a book by a guy named David Kamen uh, on, uh, again, on horizontal gene transfer and uh, archaea, bacteria, and and, uh, some of these things that uh, are hard to explain, account for in sort of old-fashioned evolutionary theory. And I see those just as details that can be incorporated into into the structure of evolutionary theory that that aren't revolutionary at all. And that's, that's still how I see um, the Big Bang as well. But what about evolution? Is that is that really ever going to be in danger? Do you see that as rock solid? I think that our understanding of interbreeding and the ability of horizontal gene transfer on massive scales in complex species is pretty limited right now where it's Mm. like you know we uh don't have any programs where we're like trying to like breed dogs with dolphins but i'm like what if that what what if that's possible like it seems it seems within the realm of possibility that natural selection is this gloss of how things happen outside of massive changes like i liken it kind of to our understanding of geology where we had uniformitarianism and it was like the forces that we see right now are the forces that shape all of geological history and we need not worry about anything else and then finally people are like yes but you know you find like the deccan traps or you find the or you you go to the columbia river valley and you're like man that's weird there is a mile thick layer of basalt on the ground here. And we don't really have a good explanation for how that comes to be without having to point to the fact that like, hey, really weird shit happened here for a really long time. And, you know, do you know the Missoula floods story? I think one of my students just wrote about that, but remind me. So the Missoula floods is there was this guy, um, I think his name was like J. Harold Bratz. He was from the East Coast. He was a geologist and he went out to the University of Washington where he started to teach and he started wandering around this area in eastern Washington called the Channeled Scablands. And the Channeled Scablands are really weird because it is a place that is desert. All of the topsoil is gone and it is clearly 
uh, carved by massive amounts of water. Like there's a place called Dry Falls where it is obviously a horseshoe-shaped waterfall into this carved-out plunge basin that's roughly the size of Niagara Falls. But there's no water. And so he's like, well, that's fucking weird. And then you go down to the gorge, and the gorge is filled with all these gigantic sandbars, and the gorge is, you know, a thousand feet deep in places, and it's basalt that has just been carved by a river that's kind of this, like, piddly... I mean, the Columbia is a big river, but relative to the size of the gorge and the hardness of the rocks, like, they're, they're incommensurate in scale. And so he finally made his way back across the landscape to Missoula, Montana, and he found all these bathtub rings on the valley and was like, I think that there was catastrophic flooding where the, the Laurentine ice sheet had a tongue that blocked the exit of the river from this valley. The valley would fill up with water and then the glacier would break and then it would unleash this water onto the landscape. And everybody was like, Brett, you're, you're a goddamn idiot. Nobody believed him because he didn't have any credibility. And then slowly the evidence started to pile up more and more and more. And now it's an accepted theory for how the, the channeled scablands formed, how the gorge formed, why there's all these weird Montana granite in the Willamette Valley. And so it's like, okay, these things change. And I can see a similar sort of thing happening with evolutionary theory, where we have to modify it significantly to account for things that we don't understand yet. Like, I remember looking and realizing that we have genotyped less than a percent of the species on Earth. Hmm. And every single time that we genotype something, we're like, oh, fuck, we have to rewrite our, our trees, like like funguses especially, right? So you look at funguses, and funguses are classified by the shape of their gills, the way they carry spores, the, the shape of the cap. And so you have, anytime that you open up a mycology book, it's organized by phenotype. And as they start to genotype mushrooms, they're like, okay, these mushrooms that have similar phenotypes are not genetically related to each other. And so there's this weird aspect of convergent evolution, of morphologies appearing that appear to solve a problem that are arrived at at different points. And if our theory for the emergence of these phenotypes is only gradual change from a common ancestor that then radiates, as opposed to these different common ancestors converging on a similar solution to a problem. Okay, so that's one thing. And like, let's say we find life on Mars. And what if we find that the life on Mars is identical to life on Earth? Like, we'll argue for yeah. forever about the fact that, no, no, it's contamination, and we'll go back and forth for forever. But I'm like, what if there is a limited space of solutions to a problem? Like, what if there's, what if the, like, the heme group that carries oxygenated iron can only be formed in one way because of the laws of physics? Just like planets all happen to be round for the same reason. Like, what does that do to the theory of evolution? But it sounds like what you're saying is a little bit of both. Like, there are tendencies for the environment to modify the organism, but there might be other pathways as well that are complementary. So it's like, again, it's true, but there might be more truths available. And I think that that's the way that it'll develop, is the fact that, like, look, we had these theories. They are true, but with an asterisk. And so there is an end of science, but with an asterisk. Because, like, our understanding of the complexity of how all of these systems fit together in order to actually create the massive variability that we see, will never allow us to get to a single unified story. Even for something like planet formation. Like, I don't know if you saw there's... I really wanted to bring up planet formation when you asked to. Because <laughs> that, that's something I see evolutionary principles starting to be applied to, which is really exciting to me, is people really seeing these exoplanetary systems. This is the first time this has happened this last 10, 5, 10 years. We've never been able to see other solar systems. Our entire theory of how planets form is based on our solar system for 300 years, since Galileo, essentially. And now we see planets evolving. I mean, I, I don't want to like totally be biological about this, but there are environments are influencing their phenotypes. They, these Jupiters get close to the stars, a little too close. Their atmospheres cook off. They start shrinking. They start looking like other kinds of planets. It's very, 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 very revolutionary moment for planetary science. And so I see that. What's great about that, exoplanets have all happened in the course of my career. So it, there were 
outliers in the 19 in the late 80s there are some people who claim to have spotted a planet going around another star system and uh, a bunch of them were debunked and then suddenly there was a flood of those just because our telescopes our instruments got got good enough so that we really could see these things around other other star systems i just wanted to generalize about what what we're talking about here um it seems to me that if you're talking about the origin of the universe and the origin of life on earth and then the the evolution of life on earth there are these fundamental questions related to the probability of things happening in the way they did why did the unit why was the universe created in the first place uh how probable was that was it inevitable or necessary in some sense how probable um is this particular universe with these laws of nature that we um observe uh this is where the anthropic principle comes from which is just this vacuous tautology that says yeah it's weird that the universe happens to be structured so that we would exist it doesn't say anything it's just reminding us that we're here and that's something we have to worry about origin of life um one of the people i interviewed for the end of science was francis crick who spent a lot of time working on the origin of life and he kind of punted at the end he couldn't figure out how life began on earth it seemed highly implausible and so he thought that uh, maybe aliens you know were landed on the earth and were having lunch and tossed a sandwich aside and that sort of contaminated the earth and that's where that's where the first life came from so again the origin of life the big question is how probable was the origin of life on earth and what does that say about the likelihood of life elsewhere in the universe what i love about these problems um both the origin of life and the um and the origin of the universe and also the the, the course that life took once it started that produced us is that you've got really smart people who are looking at the same data sets and reaching completely opposite conclusions that you know the universe had to be created and there's a certain inevitability about this structure uh or no it's totally random and it's crazy that and once in a an, an infinity chance that we'd get this particular universe same with the origin of life uh same with the uh, evolution producing creatures like us so you know richard dawkins who sees uh, evolution as a force kind of like gravity that produces similar outcomes no matter where you go so of course you know life would eventually evolve something like this where Stephen Jay Gould remember I don't know if anybody even remembers him but he was like the anti-inevitabilist who emphasized randomness and contingency and said no if you have like a million uh origins of life and identical systems um, you'd probably never get mammals again, let alone mammals that can invent the internet. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, geez, I, I would love to see, I mean, my, my, my biggest wish is that we get extraterrestrials landing, landing, uh, I mean, it'd be nice if they landed right here in Hoboken and then they, they, uh, we could study them and see if they share our DNA, like in you know the old movie ET, and uh, that would tell us a lot. And then, if we can communicate with them, whether um, they would have discovered the same uh, scientific principles that we have, the same mathematics, uh, the same laws of nature. Whatever. Would we call them cranks if they disagreed with us? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, if they've got warp drive spaceships, it would be hard to argue with them. Or if they have, you know, like some kind of uh, death machines. Uh, well, My bet's on the uh, death machines. Because, you know, the, the same question uh, about the probability versus inevitability applies to science itself. So I, I used to be, uh, when I wrote The End of Science, I actually thought that the current structure of science these discoveries that it's based on were inevitable to a great extent uh, because they're true. We're discovering the truth. Um, now, partly as a result of my quantum project, I see science as much more contingent than I used to see it. And 
I, you know, I can see just as Stephen Jay Gould said, life could have evolved in infinite ways. And there are all these little branching points that are totally random and contingent. I see science as being sort of similar to that. And I, I keep imagining these alternate timelines of science that would have evolved totally different uh, than ours um, that might have be conceptually completely different. Uh, maybe the mathematics would be different. I think mathematics, you know, mathematicians, most of them are Platonists. They think we're discovering these, you know, eternal geometric forms in the ether. Which like, is like pretty weird. Knows? It is pretty weird. And uh, so I, you know, I've become more postmodern in my, uh, in my dotage. Uh, which worries me a little bit because I think, you know, I used to think postmodernism was, it applied in certain areas like theories of mind are very faddish and constantly overturning, but there are other areas where it doesn't apply well at all because we're discovering the truth about things. But I don't know. I, man, I think now, you just, re, you just renewed my hope in aliens. I, I never actually had thought about this before, but <laughs> I would love to ask him some questions or at least see them uh, come down and, and square off with Neil deGrasse Tyson or something like that. It would be very, very, very you interesting. Know, I talked to, uh, so one of the, there's a little set piece in the end of science where I'm talking to Ed Witten, the, the string theorist, to some people, some physicists, they talk about him with awe. In fact, some of them call him, his students used to call him the alien because he, he looks weird. He's got a gigantic head. He's and this um, tiny little I'm gentle art- voice too. He's so, he sounds so harmless. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but he's really, you know, I, I've interviewed all these smart people in my in my career and uh, some of them i just think of really just they're just brilliant uh but they're human and there's some who seem like they're not they're like a different species um you know they're so smart that they're they're not like me and ed witten is one of those people but he and i gotten in a big argument because i was pushing back against string theory i said where's the evidence you know this is like uh early nineties. And he was getting really irritated with me. And, and he finally went on this riff where he said, if there are other civilizations of intelligent beings in the universe, and I believe there are, um, they will certainly discover string theory. And, uh, and then he, he sort of talked about string theory and supersymmetry and, and uh, quantum mechanics and sort of the order in which we have discovered things and said the order might change, but string theory will be part of any intelligent creatures picture of the universe because it's true. And, um, and I just remember thinking, what? (laughs) (laughs) So I actually repeated that argument to try to make him look like a fanatic. A true believer, uh, just because it's mathematically beautiful, I have to take that on faith. Ed Witten believes it, and other, and he's convinced other people uh, because of his his charisma and brilliance uh, that this is this is this fantastic truth on which all of physics is uh, is converging. Um, and uh, they would be converging on it in other civilizations and other galaxies as well. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see. I certainly, don't, I didn't believe in string theory that way, and I don't see science as a whole that way either. If I can I just, yeah. if 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 I can uh, sort of riff on this a little bit more, I wrote a piece that I'm really proud of uh, early last year called conservation of ignorance. And because I was obsessing over conservation principles um, because of my quantum project. And I realized how powerful conservation principles are in uh, in physics. And I think it's related to physicists' fear of death, but you know, that's that's an obnoxious thing to say. But anyway, um, and there's this principle that uh the guy named Susskind is really pushed hard called conservation of information that's related to determinism and physics and, and, uh, and, and it applies even 
with uh, quantum mechanics. And it had, that has a complicated uh, technical uh, explanation for it. Uh, but it occurred to me, and uh, in the course of writing a critique of the idea of conservation of information, that if I just assumed it's true, it also implies conservation of uh, ignorance. So the degree to which if all information um, is conserved, then our lack of information um, is also conserved. So every time we learn something, I started playing around with this just for fun as a kind of joke. And then I started taking it more seriously, which happens to me a lot. Um, every time we learn something or think we learned something, we're losing some piece of knowledge as well. And if you just look at this in terms of the contingency of science, that science is going in this course, um, and maybe there are these other alternatives, uh, this course of science excludes those other courses. Everybody believing in the Big Bang, as you were saying before, excludes these other possible ways of understanding the universe. Same with the theory of evolution by natural selection. Maybe there are these organizational principles that could help us understand the structure of the universe and the structure of organisms that we're not seeing because we're blinded by our faith in the theory of evolution. So uh, once I started playing around with this idea, I started seeing evidence for it everywhere conservation of ignorance were you know our fundamental baseline of uh cluelessness remains the same even as we're discovering all these uh, all these things that are supposedly taking us closer to truth i love that and i think that when you study the history of science you start to see it littered with these moments where there's just divergences and the divergences come because someone is charming or popular or it's an idea that people like or, it's or, a, or they have another idea that's very technologically practical practicable sure and so you have all of these moments where it could go one of two ways and it goes a different way and that other promising you know, path just gets kind of atrophied and forgotten and so I feel like there is an opportunity to go back and look and see. It's like, okay, so if things got really weird a hundred years ago, what were what was the what was what were we thinking a hundred years ago that actually could be fruitful for moving on from this point where it's like maybe maybe it's just a hundred years of a single paradigm is is we're we're running out and we we need to come up with a different one. And the best way to figure it out is to just go back to the beginning of the paradigm and see the foment of ideas and be like, okay, well, let's, let's try this one. Yeah. I, history, I wish I had taken courses in the history of science because every time I, you know, uh, Shiloh, this is kind of what you're talking about. You start looking into the history of black body radiation and you, you found all these, uh, issues that are related to, um, our current understanding of the Big Bang and all that. And it seems to me that if you went back into the history of science, you'd constantly be finding these ideas and you'd think, well, why was this given up? This looks really promising. And then of course, you know, the scientists or historians of science could tell you why that was given up, given up. And we went in this direction because this is actually the right way to go. But maybe not. There are always these contingent political factors, personal factors, all these things that uh, the Thomas Kuhn wrote about. I keep wanting to dismiss Thomas Kuhn, but he keeps coming back into the conversation because he's right about a lot of things. He was wrong about some things too, but he was right about a lot of things. And um, the coolest thing could happen is that, that we discover, we go back and find these ideas that, that uh, really would have been worth pursuing. Um, it's hard. God, you guys are, you it's guys really are making hard. me feel like more of a revolutionary than <laughs> than I than I realized. I, I love your playful mindset. I, I think that I think historians favor the heroes, and and that makes for a really good uh, savory reading. And, and I think that a lot of the, you know, a lot of these ideas are buried in other languages too. My friend Pierre did an amazing job translating a lot of these arguments, these letters in the eighteen hundreds, uh, from their 
their original languages, you know, French, German, things that just don't really make it. Like, it's not easy to go back and do this and really get at, the, see the debate happening in real time because it's a completely different universe we live in now. And it's been selected for these, these, I don't know, I don't know what else to say besides hero stories, but like these real titans who changed everything amazingly. And it's like, yeah, those guys are cool, but there's a lot more to it. So, I don't know. I like that you're staying, I like that you're able to stay playful because when we started this conversation we were kind of like you know the more you learn can actually make you quite miserable if you're not careful <laughs> and uh i think the way around that is embracing that that spirit of play and just well uh, you know we don't have to necessarily buy into our own ideas either so much it's just like well what, what about this you know i and, uh i just wanted to add that the the end of science is it's such a funny book like i rarely laugh out loud when i read science books but I could I couldn't help myself. You have this anecdote at the beginning where you meet Karl Popper and you go through <laughs> this entire conversation and then you ask him about the falsifi- the falsifiability of falsifiability and he like he takes your hand and he's like I don't want to hurt your feelings but that's a really dumb question. And I was just yeah. like that's so that's amazing. <laughs> it's just you don't take yourself too seriously and you have such an eye for the absurd and the humorous that it kind of reminded me um i grew up reading dave barry and uh like douglas adams and it it, like it hits in that in that vein really well and it just it's really rare for a science book to hit that and i just i really really loved it yes thanks i mean i think it i've always i'm an old acid head and um and one of the things that acid and psychedelics in general have done for me is they make everything. I see reality as kind of like, first of all, it outruns any possible explanation we could have for it. But I also see it as, uh, as funny. And, um, and so I, I find myself indulging in uh, irony a lot and, and I, I feel fortunate because I look at somebody like Karl Popper and he was a skeptic you know, he's brilliant and he's against dogma, but he was dogmatically anti-dogmatic. He's like pounding the table, insisting that uh, he's not dogmatic to me, which is like, oh man, it's just like beautiful. Uh, I, I can't wait to write about this. Um, and how does he avoid that? And uh, how does, how does an, uh, you know, a philosopher, an intellectual, a scientist, avoid it. You have these ideas, but you realize that all ideas fall short of reality. And that actually comes naturally to me because I think everything is funny. I look at humans trying to figure things out and they, they, they're they sort of heroic and ridiculous at the same time. And that's irony is useful for expressing that. One of my favorite all-time intellectuals, I also have a scene with him in uh, the end of science is this philosopher, Paul Feyerabend, this, uh, mm. this uh, German philosopher. And he also was an extreme skeptic, but he not, he didn't just doubt all these big shots around him, including Karl Popper. Um, he doubted himself and he was constantly mocking himself. And he saw being an intellectual, being a, a philosopher as this kind of performance that was deadly serious for him and totally ridiculous at the same time. Uh, and he conveyed that through the way he talked and he was just kind of this wild character and, uh, and super funny. Um, so that's one of the kindest things that, anybody has said about my writing so thank you very much anastasia it it's uh i think of myself as hilarious <laughs> a, lot of people, a lot of people don't get the joke you know they just see me as being mean or mocking or whatever uh yeah trying to figure existence out is to me it's deadly serious it's the highest pursuit it's not for everybody, but for me, it's it's the coolest thing you can do with your life. But if you take your ser- yourself seriously or think that you're actually on the path to the final truth, then um, I think you're sort of missing the point. 
Were you, uh, so to, to get back to a question that Shiloh asked at the very beginning, were you surprised that Scientific American was so upset about the book? Well, it really came, so this happened in 97. My book had been out for about a year and there, there was a new publisher who came in uh, and, uh, and he, I think one of the first things that happened when he got there, he, he saw that there was this writer for the magazine that's getting all this attention for this book the end of science and he said to the other executives like how could this have happened who allowed this joker to write this book and why is he still out there talking about it and um and so uh, and he you know he told me this to my face he said uh, if i had been in charge i'd never you know a couple of years ago i never would have let you write this book and i said you know it was kind of like oh, well tough shit and uh, and so then they actually told me to stop talking about it talking about my book in public and i said uh you can't tell me what to do on my own time and um by this time i decided i wanted to leave the magazine it was getting uncomfortable there and my book had done well enough that i thought i could live off uh, book royalties and get more advances and so but i didn't want to quit so essentially I made myself so obnoxious that the editor in chief of the scientific American, not the publisher, but this other guy who, who was a friend of mine um, fired me, which meant that I got a settlement. And, uh, uh, and so that's how I stopped working for them. But then I ended up writing for them again within like that, the guy who fired me left. And then I, I worked for the new editor starting in about seven or eight years after that and and uh so yeah i've had this weird relationship with the magazine but um then they let me blog and write columns for about 12 13 years which is really kind of them because i'm saying all kinds of crazy shit all the time um and uh but now i think i'm i think we've finally separated uh once and for all the publishing landscape has gotten real weird. Like we talked about that at the beginning. And I think that there's a lot of ideological stuff that has crept into the sciences that, like, I understand where it comes from, but it, it's weird and difficult to navigate because there's there's almost like a party line that you have to hew to. Like, uh, my family's from Russia. And so my parents are always freaking out about the like Soviet controls that they escaped only to arrive in the United States and to be like the thought policing. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, it's funny because one of my best friends, her family is from communist China. And so her mom is also always freaking out about the fact that like, this is basically a resurgence of this way of just constraining what is acceptable to say and talk about and how you talk about it. And I just, it's, it's funny to me because I feel like we're, we're just kind of on this ride. We're like on, it's a small world at Disneyland and we're all just like in this little car and we're just like passing through the various conditions of societies. And there's not really much that you can do. You, you just, you watch and you comment and you laugh about it and you cry about it. And it just kind of goes without our ability to change it too much. There is a lot of groupthink in science there always has been and i think that's necessary to a certain extent science needs to be conservative so it doesn't go flying off in in lots of directions the biggest problem i see in science and science journalism this is related to what we were talking about is just uh well in in any kind of media it's really hard to make a buck now uh the internet has made uh, has been liberating in some ways. Uh, I mean, you know, I can now communicate directly with people with my own little website. It doesn't, uh, it costs me hardly anything. But at the same time, um, there are zillions of people giving away, in some cases, really high quality content for free. So a place like Scientific American or even the New York Times or, you know, all these traditional media are trying to figure out how to make a buck. And I, I feel sorry for the people for, you know, I have friends at scientific American still, and it's just, it's brutal out there. And they're all trying to guess what they should be doing. 
to keep readers or make more readers. And um, I'm glad I don't have to figure out all that stuff. I'm just, just, you know, do my own thing. Uh, I don't know where it's going to go. And, and this also affects scientists themselves, the, the pressures to write papers and get grants and all that kind of stuff uh, really does encourage this kind of conformity and stick into the status quo. Um, so I'm worried about, I don't see it as becoming more like, I don't know, Soviet Union or, or China. I see it as just the sort of oppressions of competition and, and capitalism and, and, uh, and all that. And it, and it, and it disturbs me because I love science journalism. It's such a great, it's such a great, um, it's been such a great career for me, but, um, it's, I don't even encourage my own students to become science journalists anymore because it's, it's just so hard to make a good living off it anymore. And that I went to academia because I, I wasn't supporting myself, um, just writing books. Um, I needed to have a steady, a steady paycheck. So I feel sorry for others who, like you, have ideas uh, that they want to communicate to others and really do care about these, the ideals of science and are trying to figure out the world, um, but are also trying to figure out how to make a living doing it. You, you got to take care of that. Yeah, well, thank God we have this podcast, at least. Yeah. And, and it's been kind of shocking. Just people have really come out to support the podcast, you know, despite it not being anywhere close to the size of some of the most popular podcasts. It's, it's a really, there, there's a group of people that really want to see this kind of thing happen. And so they're keeping our lights on. We're Definitely. super grateful to them. So I think that there's going to be new ways of evolving. This would have never occurred to me as possible 20 years ago. So here we are. <laughs> Yeah. Now, now, where can uh, you, you mentioned you have a website? I want to yeah, make sure people and, can and, listeners uh, or can for find making money. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sure. It's uh, just johnhorgan.org. Um, but I was going to say, as long as you guys here, you seem to be enjoying yourselves. And uh, apart from making money, if you're having fun, then it's worthwhile. This is true. And we got a roof over our heads and we got each other. And so it's like, it's definitely, I, I wouldn't, there's nothing I'd rather be doing. And so it is, it is the fate that we have chosen for ourselves. And, you know, you say that we're enjoying ourselves. Some conversations are uh, definitely more enjoyable than others. And this was a particularly enjoyable one. So I really, really, Aww. I really appreciate you coming by. Thank you. It's, I've really enjoyed it too. I, you know, I told you, I re usually run out of gas after about an hour, but uh, the time has flown by. Excellent. Well, hopefully we can do it again in the future. Yeah. Do you have another book uh, that you're, you're cranking away at? Uh, that quantum book really, uh, that was uh, tough. So now I'm just spewing out articles. I'm trying to decide. I like to have that long-term project. Um, I'm really happy writing a book and sort of having my brain um, dedicated to some something that carries me through the weeks and months and years. Uh, so I hope to come up with another book idea right now, but, um, but I'm, I don't have one. I'm still, I'm, so I'm, I'm back to the short form for a while. Very cool. Well, right, we'll, keep, we'll keep an eye out. And uh, if, it, if it ever does materialize, maybe we can get together again and, and talk about it. That'd be great. I really enjoyed talking to you guys. You got a great thing going here. Excellent. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. So Sean. do you. Have a, have a great rest of your day, sir. Bye.